Okay. Uh, erectile dysfunction mentioned it briefly before, but uh, without this rising uh, incidence. Of this one. Like uh, you live to a hundred, pretty likely to have erectile dysfunction. So uh, everything, of course, along the process uh, can happen. It's a pretty common, twenty to thirty million cases. Age goes with smoking, depression, and uh, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. And so, some interesting aspects here. You, you know, a lot of people, for example, they take blood pressure medications, uh, and that affects their muscle uh, properties and the responsive. That impairing the uh, uh, muscle uh, responsivity. Tactile tissue, and that's certainly depression. Also, treated depression. A lot of antidepressants end up uh, affecting uh, erectile uh, function. There's regulation. You know, a lot of antidepressants, for example, block norepinephrine uh, reuptake, uh, affects her Wellbutrin, and so on. That's the sympathetic pathway, and that's going to be uh, uh, relevant to certainly ejaculation and in terms of the balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic. So, uh, of course, pharmacology can address this, as we mentioned earlier. And so, uh, by inhibiting the degradation of cyclic GMP, this is interesting uh, direction and has this, in theory, this effect that it's uh, side effects, cardiovascular uh, uh, risks. You're, the muscle everywhere in the body could be affected, and so you get to take one of these if you're also taking uh, nitrates, which uh, help uh, treat um, uh, chest pain associated with exertion and cause a precipitous drop in blood pressure that can be fatal. Also, have a priapism, which is an erection that lasts for uh, more than six hours. Then, uh, Actions with other drugs, I mentioned the nitrates, uh, but uh, base inhibitors prolong by, uh, through interaction. Still, these are pretty dominant drugs in the market. There are other uh, approaches um, that act uh, upstream. So, like everything, you know, uh, sexual desire is, of course, regulated by the central. You could access that. That's an impaired process in, in many people, or at least it's not operating at the level that they would like. And some evidence that melanocortin receptors, this is a peptide hormone released by the pituitary, uh, and acts on melanocortin receptors, that this might play a role in regulating uh, sexual arousal and desire, and that's something that could be relevant to both males. Um, next step downstream, low sperm count, um, uh, and in general, sperm dysfunction. And this is actually pretty common, too. Um, normal concentration of sperm is about 100 million per milliliter. Um, now, if, if uh, a man has a count of 20 to 40, 50 percent of those will be uh, uh, effectively sterile. And if you have counts of less than 20 million, you're basically all sterile. That's just the raw count. Yeah. 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 It causes that same relaxation effect that it dilates blood vessels. It would reduce afterload. Um, yeah. Interesting. So, is that type five phosphodiesterase? Is that sort of primarily expressed in the pulmonary high level? So you get some specificity for the for kids. Uh, 
Um, but you can have a high count, but then you can still be infertile due to impaired uh, motility, uh, capacitation, and, and fertilization. And actually, that might be more significant numbers. And so that raises a real interesting uh, diagnostic issue. You know, uh, I mean, yeah, you can have someone looking under a microscope, you know, trying to come up with some number assessing motility. Uh, there a more automatic way of doing that, a way that could be marketable, and we'll, I'll tell you about some examples. Count cells pretty well automatically, but the uh, ideal would be some measure of count times uh, motility, or even better, count times motility times some measure of capacitation. So we'll talk about those, but uh, what are the causes first? Well, it's, it's a little unclear, and the uh, rate actually may be rising. Um, environmental estrogens, toxins that are involved in, in low sperm possible, but unclear. Uh, certainly there's hormonal uh, disorder, uh, gonadotrophins, uh, testosterone, autoimmune issues, anti-sperm antibodies, or uh, Physical or anatomical obstructions in the pathway could be uh, relevant. Now, still, this is a classic case where if you've got some sperm but not enough, that uh, uh, in vitro fertilization or uh, that's IVF or something even more complex, ICSI intracytoplasmic sperm injection can be done if you've got totally non functional cyst, but they Actually, it works. Uh, you basically inject the, the sperm into. Um, so, you know, the one question is, you know, how how do you uh, isolate the sperm? If you're doing classic IVF, you, you probably want uh, uh, have um, drive the maximal efficacy of the in vitro process. You need modal sperm, even if it's in vitro, because those elevated tail movements associated with the uh, actual interaction with the oocyte seem to be important. So there's been various ways of thinking about how could we do things like use microfluidics to sort for sperm that have elevated uh, or, or normal um, So the some of these uh, possibilities are, are illustrated here. You could have um, one strategy for microfluidics. You could take everything that gets from point A to point B in a certain amount of time. That's one simple approach. Or you could have two uh, parallel streams of fluid, and you uh, at the boundary between fluid uh, at the scale of a cell of a, of a sperm, particularly if you have slightly different viscosity or composition of these two flowing in parallel, they will not mix, uh, and there'll be a barrier at the uh, junction of those two fluids that's driven by uh, the And so to actually, if you have sperm in one stream but not the other, you could actually see uh, force their way into the other stream, and you could collect them here. Uh, and that actually uh, is the basis for some microfluidic-based methods for sorting sperm. And that here um, it actually works. It's been published on. Um, now, it's not incredibly high throughput. You've got 20 to 40 microliters per hour, so it's not uh, clear how clinically useful this is. But it's an interesting principle, the application of microfluidics, the sorting cells based on motility. So I wanted to share that just because of the principle, and you can imagine proving it or, or extending that concept. So you can um, female side, causes of uh, infertility uh, extend beyond uh, you know, the creation of the egg. Menorrhagia is excessive menstrual bleeding, uh, uh, and this, in addition to causing uh, fatigue, anemia, and, and so on, which is common, uh, can also contribute uh, uh, to various causes. There can be uterine polyps, which trigger bleeding, uh, infection, endocrine disorders, 
IUDs can do it, uh, strong blood thinners, anticoagulants, that can do it. Uh, <coughs> so if, if it's a hormonal issue, uh, sometimes hormonal uh, balancing can work. Uh, moving the uh, excessively bleeding lining is also an option. And it's pretty commonly done. Dilation of the massage or DNC is basically a physical removal of the lining that uh, addresses the menorrhagia. Also, uh, electrosurgical approaches basically that uh, like the cauterized lining, um, that with uh, various kinds of heat transfer. There's a uh, strategy for heating fluid inside a balloon that's basically inflated inside the uterus uh, via catheter and uh, transfer. That can give rise to an ablation of the lining and reduction of the bleeding. Um, by microwave, uh, deposition method. It's actually nice because it's uh, sort of self-limited um, to transfer of the RF energy back in the change in the top. And ultimately, it's in some cases enough that uh, hysterectomy or uh, removal of the yeah. At that moment, yes, uh, and more chronically, not necessarily, but also predisposes to a risk for cancer. Like that can cause uh, long-term changes, uh, at a more uh, subtle level impaired fertility. Um, different but related issues: endometriosis, where endometrial tissue actually is not where it's supposed to be, surprisingly common. Uh, probably underfunded in terms of uh, research. Powerful effect on, effect on infertility and also uh, uh, it appears on the fallopian tubes, ovaries, or tissues lining the pelvis. Uh, or it goes through the same hormone responsive cycles, thickening the bleeding and, of course, uh, Trapped blood, if it's not anatomically connected to an outflow pathway, can uh, irritate. Now, is it uh, is it developmental? You know, why do these pockets of tissue appear elsewhere? Um, uh, probably, uh, also could probably relate to uh, problem is so many unknowns that I think it's basically uh, really incompletely understood. Um, Anything beyond that in terms of causation that, that has occurred lately? So, of course, in many cases, the treatment is, you know, it causes such severe problems that you have to go in and you know, take out the tissue. And that's, that actually works if uh, you can get to it all. The problem is it's not always in one clear, discrete pocket, you know. Sometimes it's pockets of cells or on a micro scale. It's hard to get them all, you know. Now it gets to, to a cancer, say, heart cancer. You get them all, and it's pretty hard to. Still, uh, you can do it. It often helps uh, laparoscopic surgery where you have a caramel light attached to a, a telescope and coupled to your uh, go in, try to do the minimal number of incisions. Um, that's traditional sort of laparoscopic surgery, of course. Across all fields of medicine, there's increasing interest in robotic surgeries that uh, could take things beyond the sort of single surgeon, single probe, uh, low and imprecise. Uh, and 
you know, there, there's, this is, again, this is far, long time scale type stuff. It's not clear that robotic surgeries are better than case, uh, but it's a big opportunity for bioengineers. You could imagine that control remote surgeries where a surgeon's not in the room but is guiding the robot in some way. Uh, 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 in the website and, and get a sense on this uh, nice interface between sort of mechanical engineering and bioengineering. Uh, also interesting devices used, uh, strategies used for oocyte retrieval. This is a pretty uh, essential step for, of course, uh, uh, in vitro fertilization, you have to get the uh, eggs out. Uh, and you want to do it at the right time. So there's a step of triggering uh, egg maturation using uh, hormonal therapy, and then you collect the eggs uh, uh, just before uh, ovulation. Um, and this, you know, was initially done uh, laparoscopically. Uh, Vaginal probes as well. Uh, that uh, your access still reason the abdominal wall, which the topic uh, approach uh, uh, used. Your complications, less discomfort. Um, it's uh, guided by uh, uh, an ultrasound. Where you're going as well as you advance the probe. And um, aspiration pump controlled by a foot. That uh, gives you then this uh, collection of uh, eggs which can be used for in vitro. Now, one question is having done that, gone through all that, can you save them? Can you preserve them? This would be another neat strategy to combat some of these aging-related uh, infertility issues. Uh, we know, we know we, you can store uh, fertilized embryos. They, those can be uh, frozen, but what's been less clear is, is the eggs themselves. Still, that's an active area of research. It looks like it will be possible. Uh, um, beyond, you know, just the aging-related things, there are Having chemotherapy or radiation uh, due to cancer. Oh, well, I'm going to, I've got cancer. I'm going to have these transgenic treatments given at time X. So let's, let's get the eggs out just before that. And then uh, if we could store them, uh, that would be great. Um, so, and you want to freeze them. That's cryopreservation. And, and uh, it has worked, um, but there's consistent. Uh, there's deep, uh, Viability. Um, a lot of active interest in understanding how, what composition of the uh, medium would facilitate the uh, efficient uh, freezing and, and survival after freezing. Of. So, you know, why, why does the damage happen when you're freezing? Well, if the real killer is ice crystals, if they form uh, inside the cell, uh, you actually cause physical damage. So that's if freezing rate is very low. That could actually lead to dehydration. So there's this process of um, trying to minimize the formation of crystals by rapid transformation into a glassy state. Yeah. It's the, my understanding is it's the same problem in principle, but but the the uh, embryos are more robust to this process, and so they survive. Oocytes are particularly sensitive. So, uh, 
including uh, cryoprotectants, uh, you know, but use frozen cells in the lab. You know, you know, you can use GMSO or dimethyl sulfoxide as uh, something that promotes the viability of cells after you thaw them. Other sugars and so on are being uh, uh, explored as well. And uh, if this gets working really well, uh, that'll be uh, something that's going to be very uh, effective and interesting for uh, uh, maintenance of uh, fertility. ICSI is interesting. That's injecting a, a single sperm uh, into the uh, egg. Um, deals with a whole class of infertility issues that are not dealt with uh, by simple. Um, you still have to try to put the sperm through a little process of uh, acetation like things. You have to put it in balanced salt solutions with sources and proteins and uh, still have to get the uh, nucleus out of the sperm, right? It's, uh, it's, it's still encased. The normal process is this acrosomal reaction and then the uh, out through that front part. If you're directly injecting the sperm, how do you, how do you mimic that process best? Uh, you can do sort of a centrifugal disruption of the sperm and, and uh, expose the nucleus that way. Careful with uh, injecting, avoiding the egg nucleus uh, to avoid careful temperature. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So it's. That's actually exactly this. So this is a fire polished glass pipette that has a, a spare and narrow lumen and there's a tiny bit of suction that's being delivered there. And so very carefully it's being physically held there and then the injection needle comes in from the other side. Um, then there's this, uh, you know, plantation uh, and things can go wrong at that stage as well. Um, uh, as uh, Joe mentioned that embryos are often frozen at the blastocyst stage where you have multiple uh, cells which could give rise to an embryo. Uh, this is the early proliferative stage of a hatching that happens, the physical expansion after a little bit of proliferation uh, actually leads to a hatch where the blastocyst exits uh, the zona pellucida and it's now free. Um, and it's got to be at the right time, and the endometrium has to be receptive to the blastocyst as well, and that's under tight uh, hormonal control. Uh, and uh, the blastocyst starts to secrete proteases that allow it to erode through the endometrial lining and subepithelial uh, tissue where it can be exposed to the vasculature uh, right at that point. Now, um, some, in some cases, the hatching is, is a problem. For uh, assisted hatching, you can have a scalpel which uh, can create a, a little incision in the zona pellucida. Uh, mechanically, uh, there are chemical approaches, slight mild acidic fusions that involve part of the uh, zona pellucida. Pulses uh, to drive a vibration of a needle. Uh, here you've got creating a very Laser approaches are being explored, so a lot of uh, sort of uh, fun device-based methods to, to give you a very uh, precise uh, uh, ectopic pregnancy. This is when the plantation happens outside the uterus. Uh, pretty, uh, you know, if it happens, obviously, uh, still, um, and can actually be fatal. Uh, of the tissue that's holding. If the fertilized egg is unable to make its way down the uterus, it's physically blocked. Uh, that's going to the question is, you know, how do you diagnose that if things are not implanted in the right place? Uh, how do you tell that externally? Um, one way is, is uh, you know, tracking. If you have any suspicion of it, um, tracking levels. Um, open, that goes up, it doubles every few days, but if that sort of doubling starts to taper off, that kind of means 
things are not growing rapidly enough and that turning very concerning sign that would then trigger uh, you know uh, ultrasound uh, uh, and other measures to see if there's a ectopic uh, pregnancy that needs to be but very early on ultrasound may not have the right resolution to uh, affect and so there's uh, there's always this uh, this question but it, it's pretty good now and you can pick up most of the ectopic Short of surgery, if it looks like you've got time, you can give uh, methotrexate, which is a, basically a mitotic inhibitor. It's an anti-cancer drug and uh, also part of uh, receptive agents, and that will basically dissolve the egg, keep it from uh, biting, and that works early in pregnancy. If all works well, that's the final result. And so. What we did, talked about biology. Any questions? Perspective?